Okay. Hi, everybody. I am assuming that you can all hear us. Um, my name is Lisa Malvin. I'm the Assistant Director for Professional Development Programs here at the University of Chicago Graham School. Um, I will help you with tech problems as we go. So if you have some tech problems, you can just private message me or message me in the chat. Um, I'm going to make sure that you guys are all muted to start um, so that we don't have like an echo. Um, I'm also going to turn off your videos. You can keep them on, but sometimes people don't like to look at themselves while we do this. So I just err on the side of not doing that. Um, so I'll take everybody off. Um, so otherwise, um, I'm gonna send out a survey at the end of this. So please look out for that. And um, let me introduce Christian and go for it. Please take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and thank you, both Lisa and Lori. Uh, I was really, really thankful to get a chance to do this. Um, it was uh, starting off with a great conversation with Lori. Uh, much like just now, uh, I think Lori and I both love to chat. So we, <laughs> we found ourselves in a good conversation once to go about doing this. And uh, Lisa has been really helpful in, in setting this all up. So thank you very much. Um, so I just want to acknowledge, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to show you any slides. This is to me more of a, a conversation. Um, you know, I'm not here to bestow the wisdom of the universe to you. I'm not here to, you know, tell you things that you've heard in a million webinars uh, forever and always. These professional development things can get sometimes pretty dry. So my goal is just to give you the nuts and bolts of, um, my industry, uh, how my career landed in this industry, how I got here, um, and, and how you may get into the industry. Uh, I'm trying to be useful to you and, and also give you a sense of my philosophy um, in terms of you know, how have I managed to, um, what, what perspective have I taken while going through this, uh, going through this industry. So, it sounds to me like from what Lisa and Lori have told me that, that many of you are either in the middle of a transition career-wise or, um, you know, you're either retooling a career, starting from scratch. Maybe you are, uh, have been out of a professional world for a little while and jumping back into it. Uh, for whatever the, the myriad of reasons there are for you taking this course, uh, to me, it sounds like the most useful thing that you could have is, is just that, the nuts and bolts of, of what it is that I do and, and um, generally what the industry looks like. So uh, as you may have seen in the kind of introduction document, I mentioned that I work in higher education publishing. So I work for the company McGraw-Hill. Uh, it's a company that probably many of you have used their textbooks forever and always. Uh, they, I think they're at year 120 now. Um, so they have been around for forever. I mean, I've, I use them, I think, in every level of schooling. I think many, many folks, that's the same story for them as well. So uh, I am here to talk specifically about higher education publishing. Uh, and also, I have some experience with literary journals, your sort of um, uh, uh, smaller scale projects. These are a little bit more like your labor of love thing. It's, it's, uh, less of a um, long-term career unless you want to do it on the side or, or do it as a side project. Um, that I do also have experience in. I'm not going to talk about that here, but if you are interested in hearing a little bit more about how people select poetry or fiction or photography for journals or magazines that are published either locally, there's a bunch in Chicago, uh, Fifth Wednesday Journal is one that I worked with, but there's Third Coast, uh, Rhino Poetry is one. And then also there's uh, national ones as well, like Poetry Magazine. Uh, so if you're interested in doing those sorts of things, I'm not going to really touch them here, but um, I can talk to you about that. So you can get my information from Lisa uh, if you're interested in hearing more. So uh, in the interest of you know, recognizing that probably many of you are in transition. I just want to acknowledge that this, again, is a conversation and, and I would like for you to chime in. So any questions that you have, um, either you know, particular to you or, or just generally about the industry, please jump in. 
uh, unmute yourself. You can interrupt me at any time. I, I love to talk. I love to chat. There's no one interrupting now. So I'm just going to be on a roll. So feel free to jump in and don't feel awkward. You can, you can cut me off. It's, it's no worries. Um, so that's the, the kind of quick gist of the, the introduction. Um, I just want to acknowledge that because I mean, in reality, any career is, is a career in transition. We're always moving to and from one point into another. We're always looking to grow, right? Um, one thing that, that is just, it's going to be true of anyone is that we really need to keep perspective, particularly in, in a, either in a crisis time of transition or in one where you feel like, oh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing and I feel kind of stuck. Or even if you're just like, you know, I, I want to jump back in and, and do something new, uh, do something I haven't done for a while. Um, I think perspective is just, that's, that's what we all need. We need to keep lucid and, and, and get as much clarity as we can. So um, throughout this, I'm going to be asking us to take a reflective pause and uh, do something like a perspective exercise. So with that said, uh, knowing that so much of our success depends on that perspective that we have that we keep from our day-to-day -day lives, uh, I want to do this little thing. So there's a question that has plagued me uh, over the course of the last Two years or something, and it, and it happened uh, pretty quietly. You know, it's one of these life-changing questions that happens to you in passing. I was in the car on the on the phone with a good friend of mine, and uh, she had just asked. She said, "You know, uh, when you think about your obituary, when you think about." your your deathbed you know when you think about the those last few things that people are going to say about you if you had to boil down your life into three words which would you choose and it was one that really i mean that's a <laughs> god what a tough question i mean that's that's not easy at all and, it, and it's funny to me because I, i'm going to ask you all to to just take a moment and and think about this it, it's funny because it seems like usually the first couple words happen uh, pretty quickly they happen a little more easily than the third um so I, i'll start off by saying my a couple of mine so so for me uh my first word is is uh, earnest you know i don't want anyone to feel like i'm a great big mystery you know I, i'd prefer that they feel like i'm forthcoming and that i'm sincere and authentic in the way that i interact with them so, you know, earnestness has been for a long time, I mean, really probably most of my life, something that I've really aimed for. And eventually that sort of thing becomes organic. Um, my second word is, is something I aim for, and that's wisdom. You know, I, I aim as, as best I can to live a life of learning and to end each day a little bit better, a little bit more uh, intelligent, a little bit more empathetic maybe than uh, how I began that day. So for me, earnest, uh, wisdom, and uh, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to call on somebody. Let's see. I think I saw um, Camilla. Are you on the line? Might not have Camilla yet. I'll try somebody else. Let's see. Is Jill, uh, Jill Wanstein, are you here? Yeah, you can unmute yourself. That's a good point, Lisa. You can unmute yourself by hovering over your own icon and there's a little uh, blue box that pops up and it says unmute. Hey, there you go, Sylvan, thank you. Yeah, right. you can put it in the chat if you feel more comfortable with that. Uh, Who's that? It's Jill. Hey, Jill. Thank you. What do you got? I thought laughter. I know that's not really an adjective, but I enjoy laughing so much. And I think everybody knows it. And I think that people tell me all the time that my laugh is contagious. And so I think that would make it on the list. No, that's a good one. That's a great one. You know, it's funny. I was, um, I was talking to to somebody who um, 
I was, I was, I picked up a side job at a coffee shop and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a little bit actually, but um, it's, it's pertinent to this conversation. But, but when I was, I asked a, a regular patron of ours, I just said, you know, what are these three words? Like I said, it's been bothering me for the last two years. What are these? And uh, you know what he told me that none of them were adjectives at all. Oh. Uh, he said his, his were all roles that he played oh. in his life and with other people. So for him, he said, father, yeah. you know, that was his word. He wanted that to be the thing that defined him. So, you know, there's no right answer. You got, I think laughter is a really good one. You know, what, what is it that, uh, how do we want to, how do we want to live our life? Is really the question of, of that. So laughter, a life full of laughter is not a, not a bad one, no doubt. Uh, Sylvan, I think I see in there, you've got honest, generous, and caring. Yeah, of course, uh, right in there. I'm with you, man. That's uh, earnest. That's uh, that, that honesty is really important. Deb, I see grace, tenacity. That's huge. And that'll be a big part of our conversation today. Uh, and kindness, of course. Yeah, who, who doesn't want to be kind? Um, so these are great. And, and thank you, Jill, for, for piping in and, and Sylvan and Deb. And for anyone else, I, I hope you have a couple words in mind floating in, uh, in and out of this, the rest of this. Thank you, Wendy. Daughter, caring, knowledge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the big dog uh that's funny you want to mute yourself i bet it's a great dane or something <laughs> mastiff maybe oh man so uh so thank you everybody for for jumping in i, I appreciate that caring humor loyal so think about that <laughs> chesapeake bay yeah i've got a golden retriever at home so oh it's beautiful so you know i think that that it's it's funny if you really think about it and, and spend a lot of time on it, I know I'm asking you to think about it quickly, but it, I wonder if for some of you did the first word, second word come a little bit quicker than the third. Uh, for me, you know, in truth, I gave you my first two, the third, um, I haven't decided, you know, I've been, been uh, again, really pining over this question for a little while. And uh, maybe it's the most malleable. You know, it's something I was thinking about when I was putting these notes together. Maybe that's the most valuable because that, maybe that's the slot um, that we that we reserve for the things that we want. You know, as we are, as we're mulling over how we behave in the world or internally or what have you, you know, are we somebody who laughs a lot? Or are we somebody who is kind and honest and caring? Um, I think that the natural next question is then, what are you doing? when you're behaving that way you know you might be behaving in a certain way you might have a feeling for how you, how you move through the world but you know what is it exactly that you're spending all your time doing and we all know we spend a ton of our time at work so uh, i think this brings us uh, pretty directly into this course in publishing and in the industry that i've come to love and, and that i'm excited to talk to you guys about so um, i'm going to start off just by giving you a um, maybe a word of encouragement, and, and, and that is that there is no traditional pathway into the industry of higher education publishing. Um, you know, for example, so one of my my great mentors and and somebody who has just really trailblazed in this industry, uh, she's an immigrant from Germany. I mean, she's a she's a first generation immigrant, but, you know, it doesn't stop there. It's not just somebody who came first generation and learned English as a second language. I mean, we have somebody who was uh, a, another whole person. Uh, they are a marketing manager. I'll explain that in a little bit. He worked in a position and he traveled the world. He had 32 different countries that he worked as in an advocacy group, had nothing to do with publishing at all. I mean, just in a completely different kind of semi-sales position, but mostly um, started almost like nonprofit sales. It was an interesting kind of hybrid role, but again, nothing to do with publishing. So there's the German immigrant. We've got this person who's tra traveling the world over. And then we've got a third option, uh, this person who now has a position as a portfolio manager. He started off, he had a master's in fine arts, he, in poetry. You know, he was somebody who was wanting to be a creative as a full-time career. And um, he actually went off into the underground literature scene in Chicago 
And uh, this is a bit where those literary journals come into play I mentioned earlier. If you are interested at all in those sort of side creative projects, I can talk to you about this scene. But um, outside of that, he went from that scene into Texas. He moved to Corpus Christi to accept a position at uh, University of Texas as an instructor that taught information literacy in our day and age. So how to determine if that post uh, is factually accurate that your friend posted on Facebook or um, you know how to determine whether or not there are actually um, if there's any merit to the statistics that this person is using to back their argument in a Twitter post you know they, that's the, his job that he ended up taking and then eventually it brought him into a role as a portfolio manager at McGraw Hill, where now he's in charge of a major portion of the business products that we create across all of the college campuses in the states, uh, and actually some of those are, are the, some of those titles are leveraged into um, international uh, packages now as well. So, so he's in charge of something that is primarily in the states, but gets leveraged all over the world. So, the point of my saying that is that. I, I think that it would not be uh, an overstatement to say that anyone can get into this industry. It just depends on you know certain personal qualities that you have. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, just to really underscore that point, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my path too. So you know, you know who I am, who's talking to you right now. Um, you know, with luck, some of you have seen the the post that we had uh, posted up online. I think Lisa did that. Um, so I, I had my undergraduate studies in English, and uh, you may be able to tell, I, li I like to think about, you know, the world philosophically, I had a bit, a bit of philosophy under my belt too, and also some creative writing. Um, but my, my concentration was English literature, so a lot of grammar, a lot of linguistics, sociolinguistics. Um, I moved from that role, actually, to, of course, you know, you graduate, and then you do you know you do the thing you go out and you try to find a job <laughs> and, and it takes a long time and you feel like you're sending your resume into a bunch of black holes while you have internships and while you have other experiences and you're just trying to build it all up at the same time so i actually got a job at mcgraw hill as a temp initially uh, i was i was accepted the job we were all good to go um but it's a temp position so we we i think all probably know what that means that's um, you know, there's no benefits typically, not in this position at least. There's uh, the pay is the pay scale is lower, of course. It's a it's a lower barrier of entry, and the point is that you get your foot in the door. Uh, and that is that was my mindset. But I actually one of those resumes from the black hole came back from a from a full time logistics company. Now this is an industry I had never looked at. It's one that I have some family who work in, so I knew that it existed, um, but outside of that it was really a lot of personal research to even look at the company I looked at so um, it was a better job it was a better job paid a lot more uh, had benefits and, and all the things that you need to to live and so um, I called McGraw Hill and just said yeah I don't know what to do because I want to work in publishing I know that I've known that for a few years but um, you know what now I, I, I recognize that I have this opportunity to be at this company and, and I also have the opportunity for a better job. So what do you think? And, um, you know, I'll never stop being grateful for, for what McGraw came back to me and said, and he said, you know, take that other job for now, but just come back to us every now and then I check back in. And that's what I did. I checked back in every three months on the dot at a reminder set in my phone and just said, Hey, you know, how's everything going? Uh, is there a position open yet that's full time that could compete with the the pay that I'm getting here? And uh, eventually, right about at a year, and my goal had been to be at this logistics company for a year. Um, right about at that year mark, they uh, they came back and said, "Okay, yep, we actually have something." And a day after my anniversary at this logistics company, um, I left and went to McGraw. -Hill. So it was uh, it was a, a good situation, but it, the the point of my explaining this is that life threw me some curveballs along the way, and that's just something that I think any of us are going to have to know and deal with, and and particularly with many of you, it sounds like, are in this place of transition. Um, you know, I didn't plan on, um, let's say, you know, 
the hope was to to go live at home after college and spend a year and find that right job and get a really good one, right? And then my folks all moved down south, you know. It's, and it, I was thrilled for them because that's where they all, that's where my grandparents live and 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 parents grew up and met down in Tennessee, Johnson City, Tennessee. If you know that wagon wheel song, that Johnson City, Tennessee, that's that's where they grew up. They uh, they moved back down, so my whole plan had to change. I I really needed to accept that full time job, but then my decision was okay. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to orient myself still towards getting into this publishing industry because that's where my passion really is. Uh, and that's that's I think really the main point of this is to understand if you're really looking to get into publishing, it's it's about persistence. I mean, it's about showing up uh, day after day and getting a feel for um, how it all works. You know, get, a, get a feel for um, the, the key players at the company that you're interested in working with. I'll give you actually a little bit, I'll give you a list of companies that uh, you should look at, by the way. Um, so we'll get there. But I went from this uh, MHE, or I went from this logistics job, which is this high volume, lots of emails, about 500 emails a day. You touch probably 300 to 400 of them. Um, it's a very rapid, high paced environment. Um, went from that situation into this full time support role in editorial in the product development group at McGraw Hill. And I was working on marketing textbooks, economics, business, intro to business, management, human resource management, uh, student success, uh, all these different disciplines. I spent a lot of time working with the product developers, with the portfolio managers, all of whom I'll explain in just a moment. Um, you know, at the same time that I was getting them coffee, I was also able to actually take on editorial projects, kind of an odd hybrid role. You sometimes felt like you left the day as an intern and sometimes you felt like you left the day uh, really getting a chance to put your stamp on whether or not students are getting the best materials um, that they can. And that is, uh, it was an interesting hybrid sort of role and, and a good one. And it's one that's actually uh, common across that whole higher education uh, industry. So it's not specific to McGraw-Hill, Pearson, that way, Cengage, Wiley, those folks, they're all, um, they all are structured this way as well. So going from this, uh, this uh, this support role, I moved into having projects of my own. Now I'm the editor. Um, that would be outside of the industry. I might just refer to it as, as editor, but the title is product developer. So they know, you know, you you show up day after day, and, and I was persistent and just showed that I was interested in learning more. And so they gave me projects of my own. So eventually, I became the full time product developer for for marketing titles that would be an international marketing consumer behavior customer service and also a um, just fundamental marketing essentials of marketing um, title that that would be for like intro to marketing students uh, mostly marketing majors or non-majors uh, freshman year and then i also took on a fifth title which is a student success title and that talks about study habits, skills for um, you know advancing through college in the most efficient way you can. Um, so those are my five titles. And from product development, I did that for about a year and moved into a sales position, which is where you find me now. And uh, that job is uh, I'm still fresh to it, so I, I you know I'm learning a lot about it as well. But sales is sales is sales, so some of that stuff is eternal. I'll get to that in just a minute. So, you know, I think that it's important to point out that my movement from one role to another within that company by just the industry itself came as a result of trying to get as much outside perspective as I could. I'm really harping on perspective. I think it's important that we take a step back and reflect before we decide to do anything. Um, so for me, I mentioned that I, I had a coffee job. Now, I won't harp on this too long, but the, the point of my doing that, I had a full-time job. You know, I was working Monday through Friday. I wasn't, you know, this industry is, is not made of money, but you're not hurting. So I was doing, I was doing well um, and didn't need a job from a financial standpoint, but I wanted the job in terms of 
reevaluating my own work ethic, my own work standards. I wanted to understand. Um, I, I've always loved food service jobs. I think everybody ought to work a retail or food service job at some point in their life. Um, um, and when I was in high school and college, I worked food jobs all through. And so I picked up this coffee shop job partly to learn a lot about coffee because I like it and, and partly to just shake things up and get a feel for my weekends uh, and, and just take le- you know, be less fixated on the goal right in front of me. And that's something that, that I think with publishing, we have this misnomer that you must be constantly on it all the time. And really, you know, it's this cutthroat industry. And that's not the case, really, in, in higher education publishing, at least not at McGraw-Hill. I can, I can vouch for them that way. Um, you know, you, it is important that you work hard, obviously. I mean, that's going to be important anywhere. But uh, I wouldn't come into this industry thinking that you are going to push someone else down to raise yourself up. You instead need to find a way to be buoyant on your own. And I think that uh, my getting this extra, this second job was a great way for me to take a step back. Uh, Everybody's different. So I'm not suggesting you guys all go out and get another job that, you know, probably absurd. Uh, But for me, it was great to get a step back and just say, okay, um, this is something I enjoy doing. This is something I can really put, invest a lot of energy into on the weekends and put a lot of time into uh, and and learn different parts of myself and, and, and divest a little my a little bit of my energy outside of this thing that I'm you know full time publishing really really care about. So that's that. So that's the the sort of career path that brought me to where I'm at in sales, and and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to just give you a really brief uh, feeling for the types of positions that would be potentially open to you depending on your um, situation. And this is, these, these terminologies, I'm going to try to make as widely versed as I can in terms of the industry because all the companies call them different things. Um, but they're roughly the same, and you'll see analogous words, say, even if you look at the job search. So, so as I mentioned, the support teams, there's an editorial coordinator or a product coordinator. That's the, the most often used terminology. Those are the folks who, like I say, are kind of that hybrid role. You're kind of doing stuff the temps are doing, but at the same time, you're actually getting a chance to dive into the editorial projects themselves. And you might not own a book or a discipline, uh, but you, you take a little piece of it. You take, take a little chunk of it and assist the people who do own those projects. And you answer to them. You try to get as best information as you can and get it done for them on time and on budget. Uh, temp positions, again, I mentioned, is that's more of your intern level thing. So if you're just breaking in the industry and you don't have any sense of where you're going to be, it's not a bad option to look at. And particularly, to if you're... Um, just kind of looking at this as a, as a side gig, because that position might be a good, a good option for you. Uh, so moving up the ladder, as it were, it's not a straight ladder, but we'll, we'll pretend for the sake of this. Uh, in terms of product development, you've got a number of key players. There's three that I'm going to point out to you. The first is a product developer slash developmental editor. Um, those folks are really the hub of each particular book. So in my case, my marketing books, I had four in that student success title, that fifth. I was the product developer for those five titles. Now, you notice four of them were marketing, but one of them was a totally different discipline of student success. Um, some product developers have one management book, one economics book, one marketing book, and one um, student success book. You know, they, they, every product developer is different. Their, their caseload or product load is a little bit different. So, it's not like you're not always just in one discipline like I happen to be. That's kind of a look on the draw. Uh, but the product developers, they're the hub of the book development. So if you envision for yourself a wheel for a minute and you think about the book and the way it is published as a wheel, the product developer is the very hub from which all of the spokes, all the other players involved have to go through at some point in order for that book to get published. So the, the, the product developer is extremely important. They are the, the kind of project manager of that. Now, 
a step up from the product developers. Now, the marketing school subject, marketing discipline, we would say, or maybe the management discipline or the economics discipline. Each of those disciplines has a portfolio manager. So the portfolio, the suite of marketing titles, they're all owned. All the marketing titles are owned by one person. And all the product developers who work on any of the books that belong in that portfolio, they answer to that portfolio manager and they say, hey, uh, you know, this book is going really well. They usually have weekly meetings, they talk about it, or they have any urgent problems that require budget approval or something like that. The portfolio manager is the person who makes the last call typically with how we develop a book. Um, they are the people who are responsible for executing the vision of the whole entire portfolio and also making sure that portfolio is growing and that it is um, you know, staying within budget and on time as best they can. Uh, now, finally, the third player, we've got the product developers, we've got the portfolio managers. The third player is a marketing manager. Now, this person is sort of the bridge between the sales group who are actually out on campus and, and talking to instructors and getting a feel for what professors need out there, what students need out there. Uh, they are the bridge between that whole higher education circuit and the product development team, which we just went through, the product developers, portfolio managers, et cetera. Now, the marketing managers, they actually work closely with both teams, sales and product. And they're the bridge that helps determine which features of each product of each book in the portfolio are going to be the most interesting or instructive for professors or students today. So I can send, by the way, I know that was a lot in a mouthful, so I can send a lot of this information back to Lisa and then perhaps have her distribute it to you if you're interested. Um, you know, feel free to leave a comment in there if that's something that you'd like to um, I need to do. I, and I, I am happy to share that information with you. Because as I said, it's going to be a little bit different for every um, company, but those types of roles exist in every company. So I'm going to take just a minute and take a breather, right? That was a big mouthful. So I'm going to do another perspective check. Just take a step back. Let's reflect on, on some of this. Um, I want to ask the question, how do you find resources in this great mess. I mean, you know there are all these key players and they all do all these different things. And, and at times it sometimes feels like we might be just a cog in a machine or something. And then we can't, how do we make our mark? And you know, how do we step out of just being a part of that machine? How do we become really useful? Um, I, I think that this is, it can never be understated and, and probably many of you know this already, but I think it's, invaluable to invest heavily in finding an experienced mentor. Um, no matter what level you're at, it doesn't matter. I was actually just talking to my dad. He's been, uh, we were talking yesterday, and he's been in sales for years and years, like 40 years. And uh, he was telling me now he's in a funny predicament because most of his mentors have never retired. But it, it made me laugh because he referred to them as mentors. And some of these people, I've known their names since I was a kid. Um, you know, that's what a good mentor could do for you. They they sort of set the roots in your life. Um, and in fact, my dad was telling me that one of his mentors was one of the reasons why um, we moved to uh, the suburb of Chicago that I grew up in. Um, just, it was out of a recommendation. And uh, that's that where I spent 20 of my years. <laughs> so, so mentors can matter. You know, they can really seep into the, the groundwater, right? Um, so, you know, I think it's also important in this reflective mindset to say, uh, you know, there's somebody who's ahead of you. There's always somebody who you can ask advice from, but I think it's important to get somebody dedicated to do that. It's part of the, they're invested in doing that. They have buy-in, they believe in you, or they either even have a professional um, you know, obligation to do so. I think that's important. We have that in publishing. It's, we, we offer mentorship programs. Um, it might also be worth noting that um, while you want someone to be your champion, uh, it's always good to find someone else to champion. I think it's really important to be a mentor to other people as you're learning and growing. Um, just know that while there are still all these people down this way that are ahead of you, and I think uh, there are also all these people down here that you are ahead of. So while some of you might be totally fresh at looking at publishing, uh, 
it doesn't mean that you are the last in line, right? Like you, you might be able to leverage your experience, like seeing my coworker who worked in 32 various countries in a job that was totally unlike publishing or my German immigrant um, coworker. Those folks all came in at varying degrees of preparedness to get into the industry, but it was about you know, what, what they were really, um, the stuff they were made of. You know, that's what, that's what really sold them into the industry. So diving back in, there's just, um, there's two other big fields that I wanted to mention and I'll do these way more quickly than product development. The product development we just went through in terms of the tiers, that was the product developer, portfolio manager, and the marketing manager. The other two big fields, and these won't surprise you, one is sales, of course, and then one is the production, which is really just making sure the book gets printed. Um, so sales, that's what I'm in now, actually. That's the role that I've now taken on. Uh, you know, their fingers are on the pulse of the current conversation in higher education. Uh, they're the people who are actually working with the instructors and professors day in and day out to determine what they need. Um, you know, the job is to determine which products or setups or systems best suit an instructor or an administration's needs. So sales is sales is sales is sales. Some of that uh, it won't surprise you. So production, though, that's a little, a little different. Production, um, you know, they're the brains behind the actual on-time printing and, well, producing of the book. They make sure that we stay on track, stay on budget, stay on time, uh, and they work really closely with the product team to make sure that that book gets printed. Um, there's a subset, of course, of, of product development I call permissions, and this is the last one I'll mention to you briefly, is that these are the folks who, um, let me take a step back, we have authors who actually create these books, of course. These are usually PhD people who are experts in their field, say marketing, we'll just use that example. I worked with a lot of marketing authors, some of whom were international travelers, had been to every country. Uh, and, you know, I would be developing a book with one international marketer who he'd be emailing me <laughs> from Jordan or from, uh, you know, he emailed me once from Kuwait, he emailed me once from Korea. Um, you know, the authors are experts in their field, and, and really and truly, but while a lot of the content, a lot of the stuff they're putting in the books are of their own mind and of their own research, um, they actually, of course, I mean, they're mostly current, so they'll include videos that are, came out last year that they didn't produce. So they'll include um, articles, news articles. I mean, we, we included articles from like Harvard Business Review, or Business Insider, uh, in some of our marketing textbooks. Um, totally fair game. But we need a team to vet and make sure that we have negotiated the rights to use this. So that's the permissions team. They make sure that the author's selected tools, the selected uh, resources are uh, fair game. Let me tell you uh, So that is kind of the who's who. You've got the product development, sales, production, and permissions. And that, that's, again, that's a very natural goal. There are a million other positions, but those are the ones that are gonna be most pertinent to someone wanting to break into the industry. Those are really your, your options. Um, now there's always niche options, um, but that will require some research on your own time. It would take me all day to go through all those. So I'm not going to. Um, now, I, I'm gonna do another perspective exercise in just a moment, but before I do that, it's gonna be just a bit of another mouthful um, Lisa suggested uh, that I give you a little bit of a day-to-day. -day. I've done a little bit of that already, um, but I just want to give you a sense of the job. Rather than what they're doing, I want to give you a sense of so some of the, the things that folks probably wouldn't tell you, but, but I'm going to. So I'm going to just focus on the two that I've had because those are the day-to-day -day tasks that I'm, of course, most familiar with. The product developers, um, these are folks who work in the office most often. Sometimes you can work remotely, though. We have people who do that. Um, some days you go back to bed meetings. So it's just, you know, meeting on meeting on meeting. You're meeting with product, uh, other product developers. You're meeting with portfolio managers. You're meeting with your marketing managers. You're meeting with your sales group. You're meeting with whomever. You've got a lot of meetings. Uh, and then some days are just hours long projects where, for example, I was scrubbing a, a whole international book to make sure that it was politically objective. We had an we had an author who was a little bit uh, a little bit vocal about his political leanings, 
and we get to that the, the textbook publisher, we have this objective, of course. So, you know, I spent many hours for a couple of days making sure that there were no political leanings at all. Um, so that's what a product developer might do. They've got big projects like that, like making sure that a, a chapter by chapter looks good and is up to bar or a lot of meetings. So that's, that's kind of where they're at, but they're in the office most days. The sales rep is kind of the flipped opposite. They are driving four days out of the week and typically have one office day. Uh, and they are, like I mentioned, working with instructors and professors in their territory. I have nine schools, so I'm based in Pittsburgh. But I travel out to Ohio. I was just at Akron today, in fact. Um, and uh, it's about a two hour drive for me. Some reps, when they're farther out, like say Denver, they, they have like three hour drives. Uh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so, so I stayed a little closer with that, uh, my, my territory. But um, sales reps drive a lot. They drive a lot, and then they meet with instructors all day. They stay there from about nine to four, nine to five, and then they come home, and then they work. Um, more and more, they email and follow up with everyone who they talk to that day. So, and then anyone who had questions for them from their other schools uh, that they missed that day while they were on campus. So, uh, it's a seasonal job in terms of busyness, uh, whereas product developers are a little more balanced, a little more even. Sales reps, um, you know, right now we're in the middle of the spring semester. We're aligned with the colleges. So, when students are in, you can imagine. We're a little bit busier because we're answering a lot of instructors' questions. So, you know, in my case and in my team's case, uh, it's something more like uh, CPA. It might be something like an account where you have a season of something like 60 to 8 hour weeks, um, which is not the case for most other positions in this company. Product developers are much closer to 40, 45 maybe. Um, depends on who they are. A lot of people like to work. But, uh, you know, these folks, uh, we're, we're aligned with our school schedules. So, you know, right now I'm working, this week I did, I was looking at my notes, and I realized I worked, uh, at the end of this week, it'll be a 75-hour week. So, uh, not the norm, and certainly temporary, but something you should acknowledge uh, if you're interested in sales at all or driving around. Uh, it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely part of it. So how do we keep it all balanced? You know, what do we do? How do we uh, how do we stay sane in the middle of, of all that work? Uh, and here, of course, as you may have guessed, is where we'll do another perspective exercise. Something that I've been thinking about a lot the last couple of years is uh, it's just a, a metaphor that's stuck in my mind. Uh, maybe it will in yours, but uh, I think about our, our lives if we separated them out into different buckets, right? Like you have your professional bucket. Uh, how well are you doing at work? You know, your financial bucket, are you, you know, are you saving? Are you, you know, for all okay, et cetera. Your relationships are social. You know, the, are you able to foster your relationships? Are you retooling them in a way that, that make you feel like you're being a great friend or a good spouse or a partner? Um, are you taking care of yourself emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, et cetera? So, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I had a friend who works at Google and she, working at Google, has, she went from Facebook for two years to Google. And so while her professional and financial buckets were really draining, I mean, teaming, uh, she, you know, her, her relationships were suffering with her family and with her friends. Um, part of them because of the work, but primarily um, just not really keeping an eye out. You know, if we're not looking at all the buckets at the same time, we're focusing on one, we lose sight of another. So, um, another example, uh, this is a little silly, but my, uh, I, had, I had a friend that was like one year of just constant brunch invitations. <laughs> and I had, I had some different friends. It was just this self-fulfilling cycle where everybody would invite one another to brunch. Someone else would take it this week. And eventually everybody wanted to go to brunch at some point. So you were always getting invited to brunch every week. And I had friends who were fulfilling their social or their relationship buckets, and that was all good, but they were really siphoning out of their financial bucket, getting that uh, eggs benedict every single week. So that's that's what I'm talking about when I talk about life buckets, is, is that kind of balance and, and getting a feel for, uh, you know, what is it right now that you think you may have lost sight of? Uh, you know, while all of us right now, the very fact that we're at, on this 
call means that we're looking at our professional bucket, which you know is usually tied to some in some way to our financial bucket, of course, but uh, or even our creative bucket. I'm I'm a creative personally, and so uh, in my case, you know, I have to be able to to play some music or, or listen to some music, write some poetry on the side, just any of that stuff uh, to take care of myself, right? And I encourage you to just take a moment and think about it. And I'm, I'm going to ask, not what is suffering, that's a little personal, but I'm going to ask, um, why don't you guys just write in the chat, you know, which which buckets right now do you think, you can make them up, by the way, this, I made this up. So, uh, you know, what buckets do you think are the ones that you're really focusing on right now? Um, if you feel like sharing, feel free to, you can jump in and, and do the video too. Um, like I said, I had mental spiritual, physical, uh, creative, emotional, relationships, slash social, financial. Um, what do we think? Family bucket, that's a huge one. Yeah, Jessica, I really like that one. School wellness, yep, health, that's a good one, Deb. Creative. Um, so important. Yeah, hey, there you go, volunteering, ESP for pause. That's a great one, Jacqueline. That's one that actually, that's that's a bucket I've lost sight of. I volunteered a lot of the time back in college and even before that, um, volunteered all the time. And it was something that uh, I haven't had the, the chance to find a really good continuous place to volunteer for. So I'm so, I'm so glad that you've got pause in your life. Um, it's interesting, right? Just taking a minute to look at these buckets. You know, are we finding that some of these are kind of leaking while the other ones are uh, really important. Yeah, there you go, Don. I see what you're saying. Yeah, money, work, and creativity. I think, um, well, thanks, Diane. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Don, I, I just want to comment on that. It, it's funny. Sometimes we don't get to choose what the buckets are that we're focusing on, and I think that that's really important that you bring that up. You lose a job three days before Christmas so hard. Um, God, yeah, I, I, I hear you. And it's something that, uh, while you don't get to choose it, um, that's the whole idea of this conversation, right? How do we, how do we become flexible? Um, how do we stay malleable enough to be able to deal with those big life curveballs that get thrown at us? Um, Courtney, yeah, career bucket. Of course, Wendy, learning, career, health, yeah. And Wendy, I like that you put learning and career separately, although I think both are um, really valuable, and, and it depends on how you how you look at them. For me, learning is actually the touchstone for any of mine. Um, you know, I want to learn more about any of the buckets that I'm dealing with, whether that be learning more about my friends in the social bucket or learning more about how to manage my finances better in the financial bucket. Yeah, it's good. Deb, I really appreciate you sharing that too. Um, trying to be okay with seeing myself at one point, using this time to retool. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's great. That's great. I appreciate all you guys for jumping in. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. So I'm going to just give you some last minute things here. Now, this is where the real meat is. So we're going to have to share that with. Um, Uh, this is where we get into the meat of kind of the how-to, how do you get in this industry. So I gave you the different kinds of things you could do in the big publishing houses, but this is where I really want to talk about the sort of secret ways to crack the code. And, and I don't mean this in any way of like I have the secret keys. Um, this is really all up to everybody's discretion and up to everybody's um, own perseverance. Like I said, it took me a year to get into the into my job. And I, one of my coworkers now, who's been recently featured in a big um, ad about McGraw Hill, um, she was knocking at the door for a year and a half. And now she's amazing and has done such a good job. But she really had to demonstrate that she wanted it and because it took her so long to get it. She uh, she got it and then really took it and ran with it. So. Um, Again, perseverance is really important, but here are here are some of the, the things that I've recommended. I'm going to send this list to Lisa, so 
Uh, you can jot down if you're taking notes, but I will send this to Lisa so she can send it out to you. One of the greatest ways to get into publishing is to work with a third party editorial vendor. I'll say that again, a third party editorial vendor. Um, now these are the folks that the big publishers, I, I should acknowledge, um, it's not like 40 years ago, you think Mad Men advertising, it's like this full building brimming with people. Like I said, a lot of people are working remotely. Um, and, and of course the industry is doing well, but it's, um, we ship out a lot of our copy editing work or proofreading work. We hire other companies whose whole job is to do that so that the publisher we can be more of a product manager and more of a you know vision executor than anything else so to get into a big publisher highly recommend working with this third party editorial vendor um what they'll do is like let's say they're a company who does all editorial work so they'll do proofreading they'll do copy editing they'll do these small random excel products they'll do the analysis of reports they'll do um perhaps analysis of usage whether or not students are using particular products that we have right so they'll do all these different things and i mean there's no major secret they're going to in terms of getting involved with them you email them uh and maybe get a recommendation from someone who you know personally if you know anybody who works in this kind of job um they're going to vet you they're going to ask you who you are they'll ask for a resume like any job but you ask to work with them as a freelancer at first you know, you, you ask them if they might give you a small project here or there. You give them some of your experience, work on your resume, make sure that it's, um, make sure that your resume demonstrates the work that you've done that is editorial or semi-editorial. You know, just anticipate what you imagine an editorial group might need from you, might need to know that you're capable of doing. So if you really love grammar, make a note of that. Um, they might give you a proofreading project as a result. So some of the things that are just eternal, um, you know, some advice is just going to be true of any industry, but in publishing, it's critical. So one, you got to meet your deadlines. You have to. Deadlines are how the publishing industry moves. Uh, and if they have to shift, you have to communicate why they're going to and ahead of time. Uh, you need to manage those expectations, by the way. If they give you a deadline that's way too short, you can say, you know, I can't make that work, but I can do it. I might not be able to do Monday morning, but I can do Tuesday afternoon. Is that okay? Uh, and you have to be confident in, that in just acknowledging your own limitations. Don't say you're going to do it. Don't overpromise and under deliver. Never do that. Uh, you always need to ask clarifying questions before beginning the project, unless you already know how to do it. But since most of you are trying to break in, you're going to really want to ask a bunch of questions at the outset. Um, this is a trick that really helped me and helped a lot of my group ask clarifying questions before you begin the project, but also complete a portion of the project after you ask those questions and ask them to give you feedback on it. Don't complete the whole thing, not knowing whether it's right. Complete a part of it. Do if it's a book, do chapter one, send it back to them. Do one, do one, do chapter five, do a chapter in the middle of the book send it back to them and say, hey, you know, is this kind of the, what you're aiming for? Um, let's just say you're, they're asking you to copy edit the first five chapters. Give them one chapter back. Say, hey, is this right? I know this is, it's going to be more work for them to review it, but never feel bad about asking it because we always want to know in project development whether you are getting the expectations right, whether you're meeting the expectations before you go on to do, you know, another four chapters. Finally, again, you know, communicate your problems ahead of time. Yes, try to fix it yourself if the Excel document that you're manipulating isn't behaving right. Try to fix it if you can. But, you know, do it to your comfort level. Um, you know, if you feel like Word is not putting page numbers in, don't let that delay a whole project. Just tell them, hey, this is the whole thing, but by the way, the page numbers are being really weird. Uh, you know, it's 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 about a, a conversation, so don't feel uh, worried about asking questions like that. And then finally, just in review, um, I mentioned these to you before, but I'm just going to reiterate for anyone trying to break into the industry, you're really going to want to look at the starting positions, your entry-level positions. Now, again, 
some of you may have a whole career ahead of this and for you that might not be good advice but for anyone starting out a career or for anyone uh, revisiting a career after taking a break for a while you're going to want to look at these temp positions the admin positions coordinator positions with the big publishing houses by the way apply for them i applied for them and didn't take it remember you know i applied for an admin position or for a temp position rather um and then took a full-time job elsewhere but i just kept coming back i kept on coming back and made sure that they were aware that i was interested and was still interested um and then i took on that full-time role after that so that is about the sum of it and i'm, I'm glad this worked out just perfectly um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, I know, Lori, I, you mentioned uh, you might say some things at the end here, but if anyone has questions also, please jump in. Now is the time. Yeah, we'll leave it open for questions right now. We have about five minutes left, you guys, so um, we'll stay on a little bit after if you have questions. So go for it. Let's see, Jessica asked, do you have any third party editorial vendors that you would suggest contacting? Great question. And actually, yeah, I just skipped that part. I have it in my notes and I will send it to Lisa um, to distribute to you guys. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to help out. Yeah. No problem, Deb. A lot of these folks are Chicago-based too. Um, so fortunately for you, I, I don't know that some of them are, um, I don't know that all of them have offices, but a lot of this work is remote. And like I said at the very beginning, you are going to um, really be asking for small projects. You're not asking for big stuff that it's gonna, you know, you're not trying to swing for a home run right now. You're just trying to hit a single and get on first base for anybody who likes baseball. Um, okay, so Jacqueline, all right, so good. I'm glad, thanks everybody for sending questions. Let me get to each one. So Jacqueline, which experiences from your logistics job were most useful for you in your publishing job? Uh, the volume, the management of volume was really useful. So I was in, in logistics, which is again, that 500 email a day, roughly uh, kind of job. And um, logistics was interesting too, because I couldn't, I was unable to take work home with me. So everything I had to do, I had to do that day. I wasn't able to bring it home and then work tirelessly until the end of the night. Now the job I'm in now, that is the job. I, I do bring work home. But I'm pretty much not ever not working. Uh, but for logistics, yeah, the volume was a big thing and also attention to detail was really important. So if any of you have experience with work that has high attention to detail, that would be something to highlight uh, in an interview uh, or in a, a resume. Uh, anything that you can point to that acknowledges that you can catch those small little errors. Now, although, you know, each book has like eight people looking at it or more, usually more, um, it's a big book. I mean, think about tens of thousands of words that are going into it and even formatting stuff that people might miss because of, you know, one version of the word doc moves to another word, doc version between people's emails. Like, you know, there's a million ways they can go wrong. It's just ad infinitum. So, Yes, volume uh, management and also attention to detail is really important. Um, so Jacqueline, that was yours. Deb, let's see, you're hoping to be a remote worker. Where, yeah, uh, Western South Dakota, because you guys went from. Yeah, totally fair. A uh, remote worker is, is totally possible, and you just have to fill it out based on each vendor or publisher, right? So uh, I don't know exactly what your experience is. Oh, you're, here you are down there my background is in pre-press graphic design yeah 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 hey uh, graphic design is great and i didn't acknowledge this but we have a huge graphic design department every publisher will have a graphic design department so that's uh, that's great deb yeah i would just reach out and ask them um you know first of course give them your uh resume and give them a feel for what you're able to do in your quick introduction i would have no more than probably two, three paragraphs in that first email and make sure you're concise, but also give them a really, be holistic as, as best you can and give them a feel for what you're able to do. 
uh, at least to start that conversation. They'll ask other clarifying questions of you. Uh, but remote worker, that's something that you'd bring up probably not in the first email. You might give them a sense of where you are, but uh, at the very least, uh, that would be something that if they feel your skills align with their needs, you can bring it up and make sure that you, they're aware that that's your, uh, your restraint. So let's see, Dawn, do I have to have an editorial background or education? Getting marketing, copywriting, background, service, and entry point. It's great. Don, copywriting and marketing is excellent. Like I was saying, my, my pal uh, Corbin is his name. I mean, that guy was, I'm going to have to ask him actually and clarify him, and he'll be tickled that I brought him up on this, but I'm going to have to ask him. I think his was in nonprofit sales slash advertising, in fact. And like I said, I, someone whose career I know a little bit better, Peter. I mean, that guy went from an MFA in fine, I mean, it was a fine arts degree. It's now managing some of the biggest business textbooks that our nation uses. So you're, you're totally good. That background is, is excellent. Anything that requires, uh, anything that's a little literary obviously will help you, but you don't have to have that. I mean, we have people who are political science majors in college. We had people who are, um, let me think back to it. We had political science, we had business management majors, we had English, of course, philosophy, we had, uh, there's one guy who's uh, higher up in my, my old team, who his, all of his experience was an art student. He eventually went the graphic design route, so Deb, that might be a good way for you to, to look at it. Um, he went graphic design and found his way now into the production group, which I mentioned, they're the people who are kind of the timekeepers and make sure everything is, is uh, publishing on time. Uh, so co yeah, marketing and copywriting is, that's just great. Courtney asked, uh, how do we break into the editing industry if we haven't had any recent experience? That's a great question, Courtney. And, and um, it's one to mull over. I think um, it depends on what your experience was before um before you had a gap what you were interested in before now the very fact that you're in this program is recent experience so don't downplay that you know we had a guy i actually interviewed someone not long ago um he was interviewing he was overqualified for this position actually because he had some experience at i believe it was penguin uh no it was Houghton mifflin is where it was um, he was in the publishing industry initially, but actually what we were looking at with him was his work. In, he did a publishing certificate similar to what it sounds like all of you are, are doing. He actually, um, he did a, a publishing cert at Columbia in New York. And it was a, I don't know, how long is your program, all of you, by the way? I, I, I neglected to ask that. How many weeks is your program? His was about, I think he said a month long. And we were actually more interested in his experience in the cert certification program than we were in his experience at that other publisher. Um, Ours is a five yeah, course certificate program. That's so great. Okay. It's about six, nine months, depending that's how. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's great experience. What recent experience? <laughs> What do you mean? That's totally recent experience. Um, Courtney, that's, that's great experience. Don't downplay it. The six to nine month program, that's not nothing. Um, so acknowledge, you, know, you may not have had a full-time career in this beforehand, but then what you really want to focus on more than anything, depending on your gap, you might mention something uh, beforehand. Um, I would just really talk about your experience in this program and really think about how to how to um, finagle it so that they have a great understanding of the types of things that you did here. So, okay, I think, let's see, what else do we have? Does anyone else have any more questions? I know we're a little past time, so anyone who's staying after uh, further questions, thank you. Uh, Lori, I don't know if you had any uh, commentary that you had. I know that you were talking he about does. that. She does, <laughs> she does. No, my, my hey, own. Okay. My question was one that somebody asked in there, which was, and I thought about how I actually got into uh, doing manuscript development and editing, and I edited people's theses from college. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of college students that are willing to pay to have someone edit their thesis or their dissertation. And so if yeah. you have 
it's sort of a mini market. It's not a full-time job, but it's the first thing I did, which then led me to people who were then publishing their dissertations. And that's how I got into doing it as a part-time job. So I think yeah. so thinking about doing this on a sort of a micro level initially to get the experience to then prove out that you have, I now have several books that have been published that I've edited. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And actually, it brings me into a conversation I had when I was still in college uh, years ago. This woman, she became, she ended up being, uh, I think her last position was a, she was a president of a bank, a local branch of a bank. But she started off as an English major who was just editing her peers' thesis papers. And was doing that for a few years until eventually she just decided after being a mom, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm good at that. I'm going to keep doing that. So she went back and revisited. Um, she, I don't even think she had friends. I think she just went to the local college and asked them if they needed any editorial assistance. And she just started editing as many random projects as she could and just, just built up her portfolio and did it and did it and did it and did it. I think she said for three years before she got a full-time position for a particular small publisher. Went from the small publisher, I think she said it was five years moving into a bigger publisher. Did that for a while and then eventually transitioned over to a bank. So, I mean, that, I think the whole compelling argument here is that there's no right way to do it. And hopefully that's something that, that anybody took away from this. That's certainly been my experience in this industry. Uh, let's see, Deb, what'd you say here? Is it a problem finding work as an older worker? No, no, I would say no. I think that, um, again, uh, for an older worker, it depends on if you've had a gap in your uh, experience, but I wouldn't even, I, I can't even really hesitate to tell you no, the answer is no. You, you should be able to find work. Again, a lot of these editorial vendors, the third party editorial vendors I mentioned, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll give Lisa this list. Um, these, a lot of the people I worked with who helped me, they were my editorial vendor for several of my projects. The people who I went to, who were my go-to, many of them were over 60 years old, and they had whole other careers outside of editorial, or not, or they added, editorial as a side thing at the end and eventually just ended up finding at the end of their career, you know, I really like this. I just want to do this. It's like, a, we'll do like 35, 40 hours a week, whatever. We'll do it. I had go-to vendors who were older um, because it's not about how old you are. It, it's, it's about what type of product you're good at. Hey, there you go. Nice. Lead in the publications department, sign me up, put down your resume, slide it over the desk. Great. Well, I think we're a little over, so I'll um, put my email here in case anybody wants to email additional questions. I'm happy to send those over. Um, and then I will send out a survey and I will send out everything, all this, the info you send me um, tomorrow. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Christian. This was Thank great. Thank you, Christian. This was great. It was awesome. <laughs> and I've already, I've already, yeah. the woman that set us up and told her I thought this was an awesome evening. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. And, and thanks, everybody. Uh, I know these things are, can be a little weird. Uh,